Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today. I'm Kylin, Vice President of the Singapore FinTech Association. Um, just want to check if, okay. I'm pleased to be the host for today's session uh, of the Singapore FinTech Festival Green Shoot Weeks. For those who are unfamiliar with the Singapore FinTech Association, we are an industry-led, not-for-profit association to facilitate development and collaboration within the Singapore FinTech industry. Um, since uh, the industry was, since the association was founded, uh, today we have more than 900 corporate members in our community, uh, and we aim to continue to grow it uh, over the next two years. Uh, for those who, for those who are not aware, the new executive committee was only recently appointed just two months ago, and the team at Singapore FinTech Association is really excited about some of the upcoming in initiatives that we are rolling out. Um, given the EXCO is relatively new, I'd just like to highlight some of the key areas that the SFA is uh, focusing on in the next coming two years. Um, the five key, key pillars that uh, we'll be focusing on will be number one, being the voice of the Singapore FinTech community. Number two, uh, fostering business growth. Number three, uh, growing the FinTech talent. Number four, access to capital. And number five, increasing the transparency and improving the efficiency of the association. This Green Shoot series uh, is the first of many collaboration uh, we're looking forward to with Singapore FinTech Festival. SFF has always been a key partner of Singapore FinTech Association and definitely a key partner in achieving uh, all the five main pillar that uh, key focus area that we are working on the next two years. Um, and do stay tuned and hopefully you'll hear more news about how this collaboration will pan out this year. Uh, with that, uh, I think we'd like to kick off with an introduction and keynote from MAS uh, Chief Fintech Officer, Sunandu, on Singapore's ambitions as a green finance hub for the region. Um, and after that, before, you know, <laughs> it pan over to Sunandu, uh, I just want to introduce a bit of the agenda for today. So it will be followed by a panel discussion, the role of technology and green finance. And last but not least, uh, the last segment will be a short overview of the launch of the Global FinTech Accelerator and some details on how to apply for this accelerator. Um, and this is the second year that we have focused on green finance as a team uh, for the accelerator. Um, it's a pleasure to have all of you join us in the second episode, um, and hopefully uh, I'm told that there are more than close to a thousand registered for the session today. Uh, again, thanks for the time uh, to wherever you are, whether it's in the day, in the night, or from Darling in uh, to join us today. Um, so without further ado, let's uh, welcome Sunandu, Chief Intel Officer from MES for the keynote address. Sunandu. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear okay. you. Uh, good evening, everybody, and uh, good morning if you are dialing from a different time zone or very late in the night uh, if you are talking with the uh, time zone behind us. Uh, very ex exciting subject, and today is a big announcement we are making on the Global Accelerator uh, dedicated to green finance. Uh, and. Uh, so we are quite excited in this space. So before we start, let me lay out uh, next five to 10 minutes what we are trying to achieve here. Uh, Singapore uh, government has set out a whole of nation uh, strategy for sustainability under the Singapore Green Plan 2030. Uh, two key elements, technology will be a horizontal enabler across sectors to enable green finance, sustainability, Technology be also a force multiplier for, for the industry to achieve net zero emissions target. Asia accounts for almost half of the global uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Asia needs a uh, 1.7 trillion dollar uh, worth of investment uh, in sustainable infrastructure through 2030 to sustain the economic development while mitigating carbon emissions. Out of the record 30 billion uh, inflows into the ESG fund, Asia attracted 22 billion. So quite a significant investment in the space in Asia. There's still plenty to do to support Asia's transition to a greener economy. However, Asia's transition to a low carbon future has to be consistent with its economic and social development. 
Asia is at a different starting point from advanced uh, continents. Millions of people still do not have access to electricity. Fossil fuels are still the cheapest way to generate energy in many parts of Asia. Yet, there is scope for energy efficient technology and renewable energy so solutions to address this challenge. Asia's transition to, uh, uh, to sustainability will be progressive uh, through deeper shades of green as we go through this whole process of from brown to lighter brown and you know green to full green. We can summarize the whole uh, strategy behind green finance in five T's. Um, Professor uh, Annie Cole will be here. I think she'll love this five T's. Get the taxonomy right, build the technology, create the transition to green asset, uh, execute the transfer to green systems, and whoever doesn't move, tax the remaining brown assets. That's how we think the whole green finance and green technology will move, helping the process of shifting from brown asset to green assets uh, as we move through this whole chain of, transfer, of, of transformation. The technology which will enable green finance, we call it green fintech. And this industry can grow up to $60 billion worth of opportunity in the next 10 years. And technology can help to, move, to, to do many things with the, with the uh, the green agenda is trying to achieve. Now, how does technology help? It can help us to mobilize capital to build a green economy. Just as fintechs ha has made financial services more accessible, cheaper, and more efficient, green fintech can promote uh, creation of green friendly financial product alternatives at scale, possibly at a lower cost, and are targeted to serve the market which are transiting between brown to green assets. We can think about an online marketplace which can provide a platform for firms working on green projects to connect with a wider pool of financial institutions and investors, allowing them to access capital uh, in an efficient manner. Uh, crowdfunding platforms already exist today, but only a small number of them focus on green or uh, sustainable projects and provides uh, some kind of, uh, and they still do uh, a, a kind of a small in their little effort to move to green finance, but many of them do not have means for investors to verify, monitor, and track the progress of this pro of this uh, uh, of this uh, um, initiatives. So, uh, so, so, but but before we go there, we got to think about the underlying data problem. Today, the process of ESG data uh, acquisition is quite manual, cumbersome, costly, and prone to errors. Whether intentional or or not intentional is something to debate on. There's what I want to say, there's a lack of transparency in the verification and reporting process, what we call as greenwashing, not green, real green uh, activity. Technologies such as IoT devices, sensors, satellite images can de deploy to collect data from source in a timely manner. APIs can also connect and retrieve data directly from companies, existing systems, building management system, waste management systems as an, other, as an example in this space. Data can be collected, ag aggregated onto a, onto a blockchain to maintain provenance and traceability of the data. If I have to bucket the, the space of green uh, fintech today, based on the trends we are seeing, there are three kind of green fintechs. There are green finance services. This is a new generation of green startups. These fintechs are challenging the current uh, generation of fintechs by offering green friendly financial product uh, alternatives while jumping ahead of uh, big FIs whose zero emission pledges is far away. For example, offering carbon dioxide offset services, green asset for investment, et cetera. The second bucket is green data service. It is a, as I said, it is a critical component to have a trans in this whole, whole, whole uh, continuum, continuum of green platform to provide a transparent, accurate, and comparable ESG data and analytics for the industry. This fintechs bring in an array of best-in-class data analytics services uh, to be the backbone of the new investment processes or financing processes like trade finance. They cover emissions, environmental product inno innovation, human rights data, shareholder data based on publicly reported data. The third buckets are the green trust certificate services. These fintechs offer analytical tools for processing data and create necessary digital uh, certificates certifying green commitments. Uh, in set MAS, we launched G Project Green Print last year. Uh, our objective is to create an umbrella of green fintech solutions 
while encouraging uh, industry to co-create innovative green solutions with fintechs to address three big uh, key obstacles facing this uh, this green finance effort. First, mobilize capital. SMEs and fintechs undertaking green and sustainable projects often face difficulty accessing capital in an efficient manner. Projects, the Green Print Project provides a platform for this uh, firms to connect with FIs and investors to access a wider pool of capital. Uh, monitor commitment. Investors in green projects need to monitor whether the, these projects are indeed meeting commitment to combat uh, to combat green greenwashing. Uh, project de uh, deploy, develops and deploys uh, technology solutions to collect trusted, quality, uh, timely, verifiable data to monitor these commitments to the relevant green standards and requirement. The third is measuring impact. Investors need to measure uh, uh, the, the ESG impact from their investment against the sustainability targets. Uh, we are developing projects which can have tech solutions, especially AI, which uses third party data sources to measure the impact of sustainable investment and loan portfolios and enhance the accuracy of climate risk assessment and reporting. MS is bringing together FIs, fintech firms and industry players with relevant expertise to identify commercially viable opportunities to develop solutions to address specific problems under grid project imprint, whereas ex where external benefits are significant, we co-share the financial risk through grants. Uh, nonetheless, uh, this remains an experimental and discovery process for everyone, uh, be it central bank and regulators, uh, investors, uh, technology providers, fintechs, project owners. Just like how fintech was a buzzword five years ago, it is same for green finance and green fintech. The key difference is we now have a shorter runway towards sustainability and climate change. I look forward to a thought provoking panel discussion following this and hope we can answer some questions during that panel. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. This is a very important topic we cannot ignore. Kaden, you're muted. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks for the, uh, for the remarks. Um, and we'll just invite him to stay on for the next panel. Um, apologies for the hiccup. As if any virtual uh, settings, there's a little bit of unavoidable <laughs> circumstances. Um, so up next, uh, we'll have the panel discussion on the role of technology in green finance. Um, and this session is open to Q&A. Um, so the five to eight hundred people who join us today, feel free to post your questions to the panelists using the Q&A function on Zoom. Um, yeah, uh, moderating the panel is uh, Take You Chia, Partner for Financial Services and Public Policy at Oliver Wyman. Um, the joining the panel discussion are Connie Chan, uh, Managing Director, Investment at Temasek. Henry Cho, Managing Director, Head of Sustainability and Sustainable Finance, SGX. Puneet Chanli, Member of the Singapore FinTech Sustainability Committee, which we just launched uh, this year. Uh, I'd like to hand the virtual mic, hand the time, the virtual mic over to take you to lead the discussion on this uh, exciting topic that we have. Thank you. Th thank you, Kylie. Um, and thank you, Sopnendu, as always, for the inspiration behind behind some of these things maybe i'll just start off um, you know just just looking at, at some of these things i we started the fintech journey many years ago in the early days there was always some tension as to whether fintechs are you know competitors or collaborators but in the but in the sustainability side i have sort of observed that you know, everybody seems to want to collaborate right it, it seems to be um, um you know, a, a multi-dimensional, multi-sector, you know, whole of government type of initiative. So on that note, um, you know, while we are looking at it from a fintech perspective, a uh, uh, Singapore Fintech Association, with MES, and so on, what what broader observations would you would you have uh, so on the whole of government initiatives on this? Because it it does look like everybody is doing something. Yeah? 
you know, is there a way where the fintech community extend beyond collaboration with banks, right, or or the FIs, but also collaboration with the you know broader broader sectors? Uh, I think uh, very good question. I uh, well, um, the way I would, uh, I guess your question is if I if I understood carefully, uh, understand this, that what can be done to bring this whole thing into a synchronized coordinated fashion is that the question yeah but but beyond beyond financial services right okay. into the real okay. Okay. real world okay. Okay. Let, let, let me put this in context that will help to answer question financial services is only a small part of the puzzle because to really move from brown asset to green asset finance does help to incentivize that shift but we need technology for the same brown assets to also become green. We need uh, we need a, 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 a lot of regulations. We need a lot of policy stance. You need a lot of transparency. The whole set of requirement can, can need to come together to make it work. So in my construct of thinking will be that there is a need for a shift. I think governments will come together. They will identify key key sectors which will need to move energy, transportation, uh, uh, infrastructure, the typical mm -hmm. as asset which will burn, which burns a lot of, which does a lot of emission. So that will be a key sectoral identification out there. Then comes the key part. How do we standardize the data across multiple sectors so that the reporting becomes something we can trust, something we can measure and, 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 and monitor? Remember, for us to comply for, for any, for any uh, uh, firm, if they want to get access to green finance, we got to look at a whole set of data which which will def, which will help us to understand the, the the green commitment this particular sector will make now only only 10 percent of the data comes from financial sector 90 percent of the of the environmental esg data comes from sector outside finance they come from hospitality transportation uh, travel tourism because a behavior is captured from end to end by 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 the life cycle of that particular asset of a, a consumer who moves through multiple sector. So the need to bring all the sector together is a critical and a crucial element to make it work. Yeah, thank you. I I think um, on that note, I mean I I my observation is that um, the the nascent nature of some of these green initiatives require investments, early investment, right? Rather than, you know, potentially bank loans, right? So it's the same, you know, old fintech startup in the old days. So on that note, um, you know, I'll like turn to Connie, right? Uh, looking at the Tomasic uh, viewpoint, right? As a, as a, obviously a, a major global investor, you know, how are you looking at sustainability from an investment perspective and, you know, how, how would you actually, you know, look at this, um, you know, slightly riskier, longer term portfolio that you might have to develop? So, Connie? Yeah, so, so I think that's a, that's a good question. Um, I think, first off, uh, when we think about, you know, sustainability or uh, green uh, investments, um, we actually think about it um, in terms of, uh, I guess, uh, overall ESG factors that are embedded in our overall investment process. So it's not, you know, we have a specific niche focus just on that, but we try to, um, I guess, consider climate considerations um, as part of our overall investment process for all investments that we do. Uh, so I think that's the first point. Um, uh, you know, that, that includes uh, looking at, you know, climate risk analysis, also thinking about about, um, you know, internal, we have an internal carbon pricing tool that really helps us guide uh, guide our investment decisions. Um, in terms of, you know, how do we look at the space? I think first off, it's still very early days uh, for, uh, uh, you know, how we define green fintech. Uh, I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, potential and opportunity for innovators uh, in this space to collaborate with uh, relevant um, uh, stakeholders to, to really drive the agenda. Um, and, and maybe just in terms of, you know, how we would look at the space, you know, a lot, a lot of what I'll sh share here is probably uh, similar to how we look at overall uh, fintech space or early stage companies uh, in terms of, uh, you know, assessment for, for investments. 
I think first, it's really important to be able to identify really what are the pain points that we're trying to, to address here um, and uh, how is that different from the solutions that are already existing, right? Once you're able to address that and, or define that, you can then, um, I guess, narrow down what is the addressable market uh, and, and uh, assess whether that addressable market is large enough um, and what should be kind of uh, your strategy or your go-to-market strategy with that. Um, I think in terms of uh, tackling the space, I think as Sabnandu mentioned, there's a lot involved in terms of uh, data and technology. So I think having uh, best-in-class technology as well as uh, data analytics capabilities kind of go uh, uh, as a given, right, in the space to, to kind of uh, lead in the space. Um, and, and probably the, the last point I'd mention is just a distinction between um, B2B models and B2C models and how um, we would think about success factors uh, for, for them. I think for B2B models, it's, it's uh, quite differentiating if you're able to uh, onboard quality uh, enterprise partners upfront early on in, in the journey, because these partners will uh, be able to help you be the first users of, of the, the product, be able to uh, test out the different use cases, and really be a crucial part of uh, validating the market fit. Um, and so it's really important not just to think about the technology or the product, but also have uh, the commercial use cases in mind. I think on the B2C side, um, generally it's, it's, uh, it's a competitive market, so really important to uh, have a good understanding of the target market and the target uh, demographics that you're trying to, to address so that you really understand the demands and the preferences of, of this target segment. Um, and you provide them, you know, seamless service, uh, you know, uh, compatible product offering. Um, and, and a lot of the successful uh, B2C fintechs that we've noticed uh, do have probably an element of uh, community-based um, uh, element to it. So whether that's through sharing or gamification, I think that really helps um, that variety and that network effect, which which is really mm. often a key to success for, for a lot of B2C companies. But I think overall, uh, it's still very early days for adoption of green fintech. Um, and so this presents a really great opportunity. Thank you. And, and I may say that my observation of the master has been that, you know, you are you are moving more and more into even the earlier venture build stage rather than the, the typical, you know, prior equity approach. We, we look forward to your leadership in this. Um, I'll turn to Harry. Harry, in your SGX perspective, we are both a listed company. Right, as well as a regulator of listed companies. So where do you see sustainability from your viewpoint? Yeah, thanks for the thank you. So before I launch into what it means for SGX, I want to pinpoint three recent conversations. Number one today, uh, someone that I was speaking to said, you know, sustainability is a little bit like everyone feeling different part of the, ele uh, the elephant and, you know, saying what yep. they feel. <laughs> So clearly, there is a need for a um, more unified perspective. Um, and more recently, um, there was a closed door Chatham House Rules event with some chairman of uh, key companies in Singapore with one of the ministers in the room. And the discussion was around net zero and the importance of data. And whilst it was clear that many people were confused by the, um, the, the myriad of definitions out there, what we all agreed on is at the end of the day, change is change. Change needs to happen. It has to be material and it has to be ambitious. And the onus is on each one of us to be able to articulate, figure out what actually makes the material difference and to define your ambition clearly. So with that background, just uh, general observations from an exchange's perspective. Um, Exchanges, as you know, occupy a unique role in the ecosystem as we're the conduits of capital and we're bang in the middle of the ecosystem in some time. Sometimes we have a say, but sometimes we want to remain silent. But what we observe is that uh, many are stepping up to lead the sustainability issues and to support companies, um, whether that be listed equity companies, uh, companies issuing fixed income those who are trading commodities 
um, or, or, or data providers, so index providers, etc. Like Connie had already mentioned, and like Soap had already mentioned, uh, there is uh, disclosure has never been sexier in, in history of sustainability. So the standards around that is also fortifying. We're seeing a trend that on the regulatory side, um, more and more exchanges are, and regulators are coming, making disclosure mandatory. Um, SGX has done that already from 2016, and uh, some list coasts, uh, while, while some have, you know, um, questioned uh, in the earlier days the foresight of uh, having more compliance, Others now turn to us and say, we appreciate the fact that one of the requirements was that we have to have a board statement, that we had to do materiality analysis of what's important around sustainability to our stakeholders and disclose that. So um, today where we're at is that uh, the standards are further fortifying and there will be um, in particular a focus on climate related disclosure. <coughs> That's where the key standards out there today are coming together to converge on sustainability standards. IFRS Foundation is centrally involved, as are the well-known uh, standard providers like GRI, SASB, and frameworks like TCFD, CDSB, and Integrated Framework, which of course is uh, in the process of merging with SASB. Green Bond has been uh, hotter than ever, you may or may not know that actually Singapore is a, a leading venue for that, um, with 45% uh, of the market share of Asian issuances making Singapore and SGX the number one listed uh, green bonds venue. And that makes us uh, top five in the world globally as well. So we're looking at how to continue to grow the market because at the end of the day, these types of instruments and the up and coming instruments like transition bonds or sustainability linked bonds, climate aligned products, climate resilient products, this is where there's exciting innovation to come. These are all um, designed, if done correctly, to channel capital where they need to go. So um, we've been uh, busy at work trying to define, you know, how can we support and how can we make SGX and Singapore the leading capital hub for enabling sustainable finance and building a credible transition finance hub. And there are certain things that we and the ecosystem must do in order to lead to future proof and to build and capture the opportunities. Sometimes the hardest part to foresee the result of is the future proving part. You know, where will you lose market share where will you lose revenues if you don't do something today? But with this becoming more and more regulatory driven, I believe that if you don't do something now, you're going to be at risk, increasingly so, of being left out by capital owners, you know, the asset owners like Temasek, or also um, not being on the right side of regulation. Um, there's a lot more that's going on, but perhaps I'll pause there for now. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe um, I'll turn to Puneet. Puneet, um, I think a lot of this is music to your ears, right? As uh, representing the fintechs, you probably see this as a huge opportunity. Um, yeah, perhaps your views on, you know, working on the other side as a fintech and trying to solve some of this problem, whether you're greening your supply chain or you're looking at data, right? How, how would you see this space, right? Well, thanks, thank you, and uh, it's wonderful to see the kind of uh, attention this this uh, subject is is uh, receiving. But as you know, my background is uh, not just sustainability; it's a mix of uh, financial services, sustainability, and uh, fintech. So I've had the good fortune of looking at this issue across a number of different industry segments. Now, I just want to draw a parallel and maybe uh, observe that every time you see a big industry trend that kind of embeds itself it broadly goes through three phases. Uh, there's the recognition phase when people acknowledge that there is a problem. There's the discovery phase when you acknowledge what the right solution is, you identify frameworks uh, which are universally accepted. And then finally, there's the implementation phase when you when you get everybody to sort of get onto the bandwagon and, and start implementing. I guess a really good example of uh, a trend that's embedded itself in the last maybe decade 
is anti-money laundering and KYC. We don't see too much debate around uh, why information is requested and what type of information is requested. Uh, private data protection, I think, is getting there. It's not there. So when I look at green initiatives through the prism of these three phases and you know how some of the other indus industry uh, trends have actually embedded, I'd like to say that we've certainly gone past the first phase. So um, we're certainly well past the recognition phase. There's very little conversation I see out there which challenges uh, the problems that uh, lack of sustainability uh, 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 indicate or, 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 or project. So I think that's great. But I also recognize, and I think um, uh, with every conversation that I have on sustain sustainability, this view gets reinforced, that we're spending a lot of time discussing what a good acceptable standard or solution would look like. So I guess, you know, in my view, I think we're at a very early stage of the discovery phase. And if you want good implementation, you need to really get the discovery phase resolved. If you have a multitude of frameworks, if you have a multitude of approaches, if you have general sort of, you know, guidance instead of specific prescription, I think you're going to find uh, uh, implementation difficult. Now, I don't want to use this opportunity to sort of broad brush the industry because I think there are pockets of excellence. There are some industry segments, particularly in the high risk area. Uh, they're certainly doing a, a great job in transforming the way they operate, defining standards, reworking their operations. So I think there's, uh, there's, there's a lot of hope uh, for the future. But this, the scale of the problem is so immense that uh, you actually need for everyone to play their role to, uh, to, uh, to be successful. So I guess in, 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 in closing, what I might say is that, you know, what we really do need with a great sense of urgency is a universally accepted roadmap by industry sector, because again, a one size fits all will not help because there are different sectors at different stages of evolution. So you need a clear roadmap by industry sector as to what green levels, what green initiatives those sectors will sort of implement and a phased implementation program if we were to succeed. Let me pause here and hand it back to you. Thank you. So I think um I think I agree, you know, I think in all our conversations with our clients, there's always been, you know, why, what and how, right? And I think the why question is no longer debate, you know, under debate, right? Everybody says, yeah, we, we need to do it. Uh, <coughs> the what question is interesting. And I think a lot of people have put thought into the what commitments that they're going to make, you know, by 2030 and so on and so forth. The how is really the question that people are struggling with. Right, and I think the the you know some of the alphabet soup that's out there, where there's so many different standards and ideas and frameworks, is is actually making it difficult. So I think that's clearly a problem statement in itself. But I think um you know the 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 broader one again as regulators and as I guess us being a regional hub for finance, is really also the question you know for for the regulators right. And so how do you actually get this aligned across the region, right? Because your your green finance might be financing a you know a Malaysian you know Malaysian asset or a Thai asset, and vice versa, right? Your green bonds here might be uh, subscribed by by you know uh, uh, Indonesian investors and so on and so forth. So so you know uh, so again, I think this is a question where we have been looking at you know uh, business sense, borders, cross border interoperability of payments, all those. These are all lessons that we can apply to this, but how, how are you seeing this space being, uh, uh, you know, sort of resolved or being addressed? Uh, in, in the context of infrastructure or as a coordination across the border? I think in the, in, in, in the context of uh, data consistency, data taxonomy, <laughs> you know, standards, right? Top property, right? Yeah. Now, now, I think if you, if, if you have uh, given, we all went through one round of questioning, I think everybody being part of an institution, we have it. We have a natural affinity for a orderly fashion of moving from A point to B point, and that's typically an institutional behavior of responding to a change. Nothing wrong in that. I'm part of that institution, but uh, and which leads to this question around how much coordination we need. Shall we all uh, have a common standard? Can can we have a clear direction on how to interoperate all this data, how to make sense of data. But before I answer the question, let me give you an example where smart people with the right opportunity can actually question a, a, a well-traded path of success. 
One example would be what happened in Fukushima disaster uh, many years back. When Fukushima mm -hmm. nuclear disaster happened, uh, the, there was a certain data reported uh, around the radiation around uh, uh, impact of the places around Fukushima. There are a bunch of brilliant scientists, innovators who decided to 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 take a very different path. They tell, look, we are we are getting affected by this. How do we measure the data? How do we measure the environment we, we live and breathe has not been impacted by this radiation? And they created this fabulous idea called SafeCast, where hardware engineers, software engineers, design engineers over the last few years have come together to build very smart mobile devices, which, have, which they've distributed to many volunteers, thousands and thousands of volunteers across Japan and many countries who actually <coughs> capture environmental data like you and me on the street and uh, where I can see six set of data from radiation to air quality and the data gets into a standard format and it gets pumped to cloud. And today, if you go to SafeCast website, you can see the whole mm -hmm. many countries with a SafeCast map showing how the environmental data looks at that point, uh, where, wherever you're looking at. And this is all created by citizens coming together, providing, using those devices, able to collect the data and make a difference in measuring the, the air we live and the air we breathe, breathe here. So my point is, that there are there could be very radical choices, radical force behind this, which will suddenly pop up somewhere and create a, an opportunity for us to create data set, which then can be used by the banks and the finance, uh, by the green fi fintechs or whoever it is to start measuring this, the asset getting created from brown to green and hope that will be a faster way to solve the issue. But that's radical thinking. And there are examples as articulated in this case of Fukushima disaster. Now, yes, of course, uh, <coughs> the, there's a need for <coughs> collaboration around data standards <coughs> because E is uh, part of the ESG data set. In fact, ASNG becomes far more complicated because there are <coughs> far more sens state sensitive around this such data. But this is a process where every country will start gradually catching up in terms of that urgency to move and they will gradually ag agree on certain small data set to be shared. And hence, our, our the, hence my comment was that we will not jump in from brown to green, we'll be jumping into brown to shades of green. And that process will come as, as, as process mature, data sets become easily available and able to process the such data before we extend uh, last skill financing to this, uh, uh, to, to, to the next um, asset build up in this part of the world or wherever it is. So, so it'll be a gradual process. Uh, the first set of data will be green data and AS and G will follow. And, and that's how we believe. And in fact, one of the way to do it will be that perhaps from our side, we'll create a lot of bilateral pro projects of common interest where we'll involve a regulator, a policymaker, a bank, uh, a couple of central bank, fintechs, data provider who can come together, execute some pilot projects and those can become a template for how do we define an industry-wide uh, approach to this subject? So watch out this space. We are in the process of identifying pilots across border, and hopefully that becomes a template for this coordinated response to this absolutely critical area of focus for all of us. Thank you. We are getting a number of questions from the chat. Um, maybe, you know, let me just sort of you know, ask a couple of these questions so that we, we get it, um, you know, uh, interactive response, right? But I think to your point, um, and, and, and maybe Punik can, can answer this, I think the question was, while well, it's easier to think about green bonds and tracking metrics for the larger corporate, how do you think, how, how should we think about this for this micro SME space? Oh, well, thank you. That's uh, whoever's posed that question. I think uh, that's a great question. And thank you very much for that. I think that in, in many respects defines the problem. There's a there's a vast swath of people out there, small companies, mid-sized companies who are actually feeling a little neglected from this process, even though they're not neglected when it comes to force of expectations uh, for them to change. A lot of a lot of the frameworks that we see around the world are based on publicly available information. Uh, and by definition, the small companies don't have that much in the public domain, so they get naturally excluded. 
So one way to actually address this problem really is to uh, to look at stars in uh, any in, in each industry segment by size. So in every every space, uh, the the question that people come up with is what you uh, is what you're asking me to implement sensible practical. Now the way to address that is to look at the best practices in every segment by size. Uh, if you if you find that and, and in every industry segment you will have some companies are doing exceptional work, and if you can start giving people uh, a point of reference as to where they stand vis-a-vis -vis the best in class in that segment, you create a natural aspiration, and you take out the debate around implementability, and this becomes a self-fulfilling dynamic because um, the stars will not stay steady. You know when they see other people coming close to the standards that they've set they'll start sort of taking that standard to the next level. So you create a virtuous cycle where you create implementability and you create progress in a dynamic manner. So that would be a peer learning in a, in, a, in, a, in a nutshell, you know, peer comparison and peer learning, I think, for the small companies uh, with a simplified framework and a focus on, on, uh, on execution, would I, I would say be the way to go and address that problem. You know, uh, I will argue in very different way that uh, I mean, I'm a little more optimistic. I mean, forget about finance, regular finance, micro entrepreneurs don't have access to regular finance. Forget about green finance. I mean, that's the second uh, second stage problem. Uh, I think uh, uh, due to COVID and due to this massive push to sustainable uh, economic growth and much more near, near uh, uh, local, local market growth, you will find a lot of micro entrepreneurs are back in the game, which means a lot of a lot of uh, uh, countries and their provinces and their small towns will start promoting local enterprise who are far more sustainable. They are far more designed to support the local ecosystem. So finance can find a way into this new uh, new design of economic construct coming in future, pr primarily driven to self sustainable construct post pandemic. And that is far more green approach than current approach of going through online ordering goods, which is coming from a many dis a large distance of travel and burning fuels and and a fossil fuel to get a goods to your to your doorstep. I think the decentralization of economic uh, de development can, can may be a way to do a path of an economic growth based on sustainable and green objective. Yeah, I think I think. Yep, Karen. Maybe I'll just add uh, to that. I think one of the kind of constraints to um, uh, you know a green a green finance adoption. I think Sonandu had mentioned this earlier. It's just around data and the complexity around data. And that's true for large companies, but even more true, right, for for the smaller companies. So this this involves, um, I guess, consistency of uh, the standards and definitions around green finance, uh, measuring and tracking these relevant data points, interpreting the data, making sure the you know, consistency of the data, also measuring the impact and the outcome through data. And this not only refers to your own immediate business, but you also have to think about those, that of your clients, of your suppliers, of your uh, investee companies, if you're uh, in, in the investment industry. Um, so it's actually really quite complex. Um, so I think the opportunity lies in the, you know, in, in you know, if we're able to achieve um, better data, more efficient data, and then also establishing uh, even stronger links between uh, ESG and positive outcomes to create that incentive. Um, so I think technology solutions that can help facilitate that process, um, you know, whether it's uh, through di digitization, aut automating uh, the data collection, the measurement, the verification process, really help address some of these pain points and also help lower costs, which uh, would be also very helpful for green finance adoption, especially uh, for the smaller companies. In fact, thank you. Thank you. I would say to Connie's point, a micro entrepreneur have a micro set of data. The data set is far more simpler. In fact, we can design smarter product, green product for micro entrepreneurs than to large enterprise who have more complex process all connected to other sectors. And that can be much more complex when it comes to data collection and monitoring. So I would argue that micro entrepreneurs, if they're smart, they can actually get, can be, can take advantage of this and attract more capital, which they anyway need. If I if I look at it from uh, just the experience of having mandated uh, sustainability reporting in the last five years, 
Um, I, I mentioned that e even the list, so the listed small and mid caps are relatively uh, large compared to the micro SMEs that's being mentioned. So still, it is still seen as a cost exercise by many. But again, to emphasize that that is changing by regulatory change soon. In a recent uh, conversation with one of the um, VCs, um, they, uh, they, they mentioned that they focus on impact. But when, when, when the query was out to say, um, how do you measure impact? What's your definition? What standards do you follow? Um, they explicitly mentioned that they actually don't follow it. They don't measure it. So actually, if we want to scale the flow of capital towards the MSMEs, it is just reality that there does need to be better tracking of what is the definition of the impact that you're having in particular. So really just what is the impact that you're having, right? And what is the impact that the capital that is to be deployed in is to the MSME um, can have by investing in your company? So the more and better you can define that as part of your uh, solution statement, the better it would be. Now, just um, you know, one scale a little bit uh, further, um, there are, for example, regulated private exchanges um, that was mentioned up front. Um, two examples that are operating here include uh, iStox and Capbridge, mm -hmm. both of which are regulated by MAS. Um, you know, SGX uh, see the importance of helping to grow the pre-pre-IPO um, and, and to create liquidity in these particular in instances, secondary trading, right, for the junior companies. And therefore, we are investors, minority investors in these companies as well. So, um, yes, there aren't uh, specific um, perks for green or climate aligned or decarbonization companies today. Um, but, you know, if there are those out there who have ideas on how to affect this at scale, then please do reach out. We're all looking at ideas as to how to make it happen at all parts of the ecosystem. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's consistent that, um, you know, we, 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 we are seeing the issues around data and all that. But I think the inspiration that we draw from the fintech community is the same things that have been used in the past to address uh, you know, financial inclusion, right? The use of alternative data, use of payment data, telco data, utility data. So I think it's really, you know, getting our mindsets around solving problems rather than, I guess, waiting for regulations and standards to be put in place. So I think that'll be an interesting challenge for this year's uh, accelerator program. And I, you know, and um, you know, hopefully we'll 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 get the same sort of energy that we have seen in the in the financial inclusion space. Um, interesting question again. Um, actually, very very much a lot of interest in uh, in Tamase. So there are questions around. You know, tell us a bit more about the Tamase Blackrock Decarbonization Fund, right? What 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 drives that, and you know, what's the ambition behind it? Um, there is also a question. Um, you know, around your carbon pricing. How does that work? And you know, um, you know, is is it is it is it used for carbon offsetting? Uh, do you think carbon directives will be a, a valuable addition? So for me, uh, feel free to answer or not answer, depending on whatever confidential uh, constraints that you might have. Uh, sure. Um, yeah, maybe it helps to put a little bit of context in terms of our overall sustainability strategy uh, before before going into to the specific partnership with BlackRock. Um, so, so at Tomasek, we think about sustainability as a you know, core part of what we do. Um, and as part of our green commitments, we had um, a target to have our carbon emissions attributed to our investment portfolio by 2030. And this is off of a 2010 baseline. And the eventual goal is to get to uh, net neutrality by 2050. Um, and we plan to do that through you know, different uh, focus areas. Um, one being working with our uh, existing portfolio companies to uh, identify opportunities to reduce uh, carbon emissions. And that could be uh, through operating efficiencies. Um, it could be through investing in new technologies. Uh, or even business transformations. Um, so in many circumstances, you know, we don't think us divesting uh, the stake to kind of lower 
carbon emissions is the right uh, choice uh, because it actually doesn't really solve the issue. Um, and as a long-term investor, we actually have the ability to, to uh, engage proactively to drive uh, positive outcomes. So that's one pillar of, of the strategy in terms of uh, how do we meet that target. Um, the second one uh, I, had, I had mentioned uh, earlier, just in terms of uh, all our investments uh, that that we have, uh, we we have an embedded um, you know ESG and climate considerations in terms of our overall investment framework, um, and you know that includes the climate risk analysis, internal uh, carbon pricing tools that help us uh, as, as a guide for us to make investment decisions. So that's that's a good pillar. Um, I think the third is also uh, solutions and investing in solutions. So as part of our investment uh, focus areas, we look to uh, invest in carbon reduction, uh, carbon removal technologies, uh, as well as nature-based solutions. And then the very last uh, point I would say is that we also recognize that we're much uh, more impactful partnering and collaborating with um, like-minded institutions to push the sustainability agenda. So. Um, that sets the context in terms of, um, you know, this partnership that we recently announced uh, with BlackRock uh, called Decarbonization Partners. And the, the intention there is, you know, the, the our two firms will commit uh, 600 million U.S. as initial capital to um, launch multiple funds uh, in the kind of late stage VC uh, or early stage growth phase uh, that will focus on uh, decarbonization solutions. So that's how it fits into kind of our overall um, sustainability strategy. Thank you. So hope that uh, satisfies the curiosity about what the master is doing. <laughs> um, but on a, on a, another note, right? I think there is also questions around where do you see where both you know the master and SJC in terms of sector opportunities for transitioning. Right, is it in real estate or you know, are there specific areas in Southeast Asia where you will put more emphasis on? Yeah, so either okay. Yep, Karen, Harry. Yes, so um it it's in terms of um sectoral perspective and the the the, the word transition was used. So I'm I'm assuming you're uh, referring to the change that needs to happen, which then yes. includes some of the um sectors which are higher um uh, emitting in nature. Recently, um, uh, and, and um, you know, this is, uh, you know, really a lot of attributes, um, you know, many thanks to MAS for convening the industry around this. Um, there was um, a, a consultation paper that was launched around uh, a potential Singapore taxonomy. There is now works going on on ASEAN taxonomy. Now, it so happened I was uh, quite uh, actively involved in that work stream. And one of the first things that we did was to look at looking at the industry classification, right? And certain um, information out there. What are the industry classifications using the so-called ISIC system, um, uh, which have the highest GDP contribution across ASEAN? And which sectors, again, relying on third party data have the highest uh, um, carbon uh, footprint. And so um, based upon that, there were certain sectors which were included in scope. Those definitely included the usual suspects like the power sector. I believe um, real estate was included, agriculture as well. Um, so, you know, some of the key industries that you see operating across the ASEAN were looked at. Um, if you look at, for example, the EU taxonomy as well, there's identification of approximately 70 subsectors and subcategories. Again, a system was used to identify um, uh, using an industry classification system called NACE, which is a European offshoot of uh, ISIC. And um, essentially, in each of these sectors, then you'd have to look at, uh, you know, what are the key drivers? There's regulatory angle and there's the technology angle. 
And if the technology is not at scale today, then the, really the key focus has to be on decarbonization around that. Um, and those include a very hot topic around uh, APAC would be um, the steel industry, for example. Um, you know, one of the most liquid uh, derivative contracts on the exchange is the iron ore uh, 50, so-called iron ore 50, uh, which is the uh, hedging tool for um, iron ore sourcing in, in China. Right. So, um, you know, what, given that the technologies around electric arc system in the steel uh, industry to decarbonize that is not at scale, clearly a lot of money needs to go into that. Power, right? The solutions are at scale, but not necessarily easy. So there has to be a push between regulatory and technology, etc. So, um, you know, the, the, do, do look up the Singapore um, consultation paper around the taxonomy. Uh, which was released in, uh, in in December, and I think the consultation already closed. But uh, you know, there's ongoing work to see what uh, can be done there, and the same work is ongoing at ASEAN front. There is work ongoing between China and EU um, in, in in order to look at what could be the common grounds in taxonomy as well. There. Thank you. So um, maybe turning back to another question, I think I think. Um, stop as you mentioned, the carbon tax is sort of the fourth, you know, fourth, fourth activity at one point. Uh, but I think the question was apart from the, the, the I guess punitive measure, what are the incentives that are going to be in place to actually drive the right behavior? So you have a green print grant, and, you know, other incentives that you might want to share with the, you yes. know, with the audience. Well, well, uh, and I'm not sure what the punitive measures work because it's still a, I mean, it's still starting because remember what I was saying, Asia's economic, socio-economic construct is very complex. It's not like a developed country like Europe where you can transit from green to uh, brown to green uh, easily. Here we have very fundamental challenges. There are people who still need regular finance. There are energy challenges. There is there are a whole set of things to be resolved at the bottom of the pyramid. So, so I think punitive uh, method um, may not be applicable or maybe relevant for now till we come to a stage where we can think about it. But for now, I think incentives should work well. Uh, we have we have gone through a series of uh, programs, uh, consultation. We have put money on the table. We have put uh, a couple of billion dollars for asset managers too who are investing in the space. We have put a grant which is uh, uh, around uh, uh, fifty million dollar Singapore. Uh, which specifically sub supports green projects uh, pilots uh, as long as you fit into one of those three, uh, three category I, I laid out mobilizing capital monitoring commitment and measuring impact um, in fact if you have a if you have idea to uh, which will uh, which is a first of a kind where it's a uh, impact making platform we have we will find a way to uh, fund such initiatives as, as an experiment so money on the table Commitment is out there. Standards being under discussion. Uh, large capital being uh, committed to 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 support uh, asset managers putting money behind these new assets. So a whole set of uh, incentives are in place. What I'm missing now is people who are going to take this incentive and do something about it. That's the reason why uh, today we announced this global accelerator, which is perhaps one of the most uh, rich. Uh, event in terms of money we give in terms of who, who wins this uh, event, uh, this uh, accelerator. So we are looking for solutions. I'm desperate looking for ideas where we can come and co-work together. I'm going to use this platform to reach out to as many people who can come to us, sit with us or reach out to us uh, electronically or email and call or whatever it is, and, and, and we'll find a way to work together. So let's put more incentive, more awareness, more uh, transparency to this process before talking about punitive measure because we are in the process of transition and the transition is most critical in this whole ga whole journey. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> so I think we are we are going to close off soon um, and actually go to the the main event about the the fintech that the, the the thinking behind it, the the, the ambition behind it, and so on and so forth. But I think just to close, right? I'm going to just around go around the table again. Um, I I think it would be good to actually 
provide some advice to all the fintechs that are thinking of applying for this, right? Um, you know, how would your, you know, what advice would you give them? And, you know, how would your as larger companies or even the regulator seek to collaborate with them and to guide them, you know, is in, a, in a journey as important as this? Uh, maybe, Connie, starting with you as an investor. Um, sure. Um, I, I think, um, you know, uh, as I mentioned, I think it's fairly important to, you know, clearly identify what is that pain point that, uh, you know, as a, as a fintech you're trying to address uh, so that so that you can then define, you know, what market you're going after and the strategy that that you, that uh, that should be, you know, most appropriate. Um, I think ultimately uh, it is really important to collaborate with relevant stakeholders uh, as partners and, and to really, um, I guess, validate the the product market fit, uh, and and ultimately, I think the the as we can tell from this conversation that the space is actually really at an early stage, uh, and and I think the white space is is enormous. So I think the opportunity here uh, for innovators in the space is is really large. Um, and so I think as Tomasic, we also look forward to, um, you know, tracking and, you know, looking at all the developments in the space uh, and working, you know, together with, with uh, uh, partners that, that uh, want to drive change and, uh, you know, accelerate the adoption of green finance. Thank you. So again, uh, moving on to, to Harry, I mean, what would your advice be for all the fintechs participating in this? I mean, we would like to encourage them to come on board and we would like to help them in their journey. Yeah. The green is so wide, right? As is green finance. I would say whatever sector you're looking at, know what are the material points. So financially, in particular, if you're going to an investor and doing, looking to do fundraising, know what is financially material in a sector. And one quick cheat sheet to look at that could be um, SASB. So S-A-S-B, SASB standards provide what's called financial materiality matrix um, for different subsectors. So that's a quick check. I would also advise you build, know your ecosystem. There's a lot more aware of out there. So know your build ecosystem, build your ecosystem and focus. So as, as Connie said, know what the exact pain point is and focus on that MVP. Thank you. <laughs> and and put it in the uh, FinTech Association, what, what do you envisage uh, we can do to help our members in this phase? Well, I think, uh, you know, three things, three very quick comments. So uh, the Singapore FinTech Association has, has already achieved the first objective, which is stressing the importance of uh, sustainability by creating the sustainability subcommittee. Uh, I think it, it, it tells everyone that this is going to be a subject that's going to be front and center of, of the work that uh, that the SFA will, will sort of undertake. So that's, that's I think, a big tick. <coughs> I think that the, the committee itself is relatively new. Uh, but uh, what I'm really happy to see is that the direction of travel is becoming very, very clear. So there are two broad areas where the SFA subcommittee is focusing. The first is to really create uh, collaboration for fintechs in Singapore with cross-border counterparts uh, so that they can learn from, from them, uh, especially if they are creating products that will make other parts of the industry more sustainable. So that uh, fastens their... Um, or quickens their sort of learning curve and they allows them to not reinvent the wheel. So that's one, one aspect. Uh, the other aspect, which I think is, is equally, if not more important, is that we're looking to, uh, to sort of embed sustainability in the 900 and growing members of the SFA. Um, so it's not just about creating sustainable products, but really making sure that you practice them and these are, by definition, uh, small companies, relatively small companies, most of them. So it's easy; it, it'd be easy for them to embed these practices. And as they grow, uh, they can actually become influencers for the lar larger ecosystem. So I would say those would be the three areas where the, the SFA is uh, focusing. Thank you. And, and so, closing remarks. Uh, yeah, well, I would uh, take all the comments uh, fellow panelists made. Uh, uh, the only thing I will add to it that, as I said at my, on my on my remarks or during the panel, 
fintechs of financial sector, the incumbent only holds 10% of the data which they need to make that green, transi green finance transition. Fintechs actually have an unprecedented advantage of holding their accessing data beyond that 10%. They have so 70 to 80% of data. And if they can find a creative way to use those data set and offer compelling financial, a green finance product from computing carbon points, uh, uh, providing ac access to investment on uh, uh, green link pro products, I think the fintechs, I have a st strange feeling if fintechs can just adjust their existing business model, they will run ahead of traditional financial institution when it comes to green finance. That's my optimism and that, that's really a possibility. Thank you. So on that note of optimism and positivity, you know, I like to I like to end this with a great, you know, um, gratitude to the team, to the to the panel. I think you have given a lot of good advice to fintechs. You have actually raised the ambition levels that you know, everybody's looking at this in in a very positive light. And uh, I like to turn this to the to the um, to my colleague Ben to start talking about what this global fintech accelerator is. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Len. Thank you, thanks, Len. Thank you, thanks. Do we want kind of, do we want to do the video report? Or should I go into yeah, actually, um, I think what with that, I think we can just uh have a little bit get uh we'll just share more about the global fintech accelerator first. Um, so this is the sixth time that we have uh, launched this accelerator, uh, organized by MES, not from SFA. Um, and the second time that we have one, the second time that we focus on green finance or green fintech. Um, so I think first up, we'll just hear from our previous winners and then follow that, uh, Ben could just elaborate more on the closing presentation about what do we, what are we expecting for this year's uh, global fintech accelerator? Um, yeah, with that, I think we can just start off by uh, showing some of the thoughts from our previous winners first. Hi, I'm Antela Benz. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Intensel. Intensel is Asia's first climate tech company analyzing financial risk related to climate change and extreme events. gave us the platform not only to fine-tune our product, connect to potential, potential company, to partner companies as well as potential investors, but at the end, get that much needed award, which is a proof of the market need for this kind of solution, which is a proof of the technology we have developed and which is the ultimate enabler solution for governments, communities, and companies especially to move from a high carbon to a low carbon economy. Hello, here is Jacek from Warsaw, Poland. So we visited a Singapore FinTech Festival in 2017, 18 and 19 and we are now proud winner of Global Fintech Accelerator. Business steadily growth, which is a wonderful outcome of our work with our Accelerator mentors and an outcome of the MAS prestigious award. Now, after these two turbulent last pandemic years, we returned to Singapore. We signed a partnership agreement with a go-to-market strategy company so that we address Singapore's leading edge demand for blockchain adoption in various sectors. Fantastic. Um, I'll pick it up from here. This is Ben from Oliver Wyman. Um, 
And now that we have had a fantastic panel discussion and just heard a little bit from the panelists, um, I will take us through a little bit what the FinTech Accelerator really is, is all about, how it's going to work, I can give you some concrete instructions from what you can expect from here, and obviously um, how you can participate, because ultimately this is what this is really all about, um, to get as many FinTechs from around the world involved in this, this innovation competition for this year. So if we go to the first page. Let's go to the next page in the presentation. Thank you. So the FinTech Accelerator, as we've just heard, has been running for the last few years. And this year, the focus is very much on green finance. And what the Accelerator is trying to do is to look for innovative and market-ready solutions that can address real-life business challenges. So the idea is to really come up with concrete solutions, prototypes, and MVPs at the end of this, and give companies the chance to use this as an opportunity to, to grow, scale, get support, mentorship, and so on. And I think during the panel discussion today, we heard a lot of nascent the spaces, how early it is, how much open white space there is. So there's a tremendous amount of opportunities that can be addressed. And the accelerator is really trying to see to bring innovation into this into this discussion. So, what's the accelerator in a nutshell? We're looking to identify up to 15 finalists through the accelerator program, and those 15 finalists um, obtain quite a lot of support. There's a cash stipend of twenty thousand um, dollars. There's access to APIC, which is a plan box that allows rapid prototyping, building an MVP, and so on. There's extensive mentorship by corporate champions that we are going to make available to all the finalists to work with them to find concrete applications for their technologies and their ideas uh, here in Singapore, the region, but also globally. Um, access to potential clients to trial the product, to obtain real data, real prototypes and so on, as well as investors. I mean, we have seen in the, in the reel that was just played that a lot of the participants have obtained funding subsequently and got exposure to the investor base. And finally, as you can see on this page here, um, the finalists will be fast-tracked to um, receive a $200,000 financial sector technology innovation proof of concept grant from the MAS, um, which further is intended to accelerate the development of, of these finalists. Um, and as a finalist, um, you then have the chance to present your solutions at the global stage at the Singapore FinTech Festival in November this year um, with further cash prices to be won um, by, the, by those finalists. So that's kind of what's, what's in it um, for you as a finalist. It's a fantastic chance to be part of an extremely exciting topic, um, help drive the agenda, but more importantly, get support in multiple shapes and forms to, to scale your company or your ideas up and take them to market. Now, if we go to the next page, we heard a little bit earlier around um, the different problem statements, and I think Nandu introduced it really well. We have structured the problem statements around three buckets. Um, the mobilization of capital, monitoring commitments, and measuring impact. And within each of them, there's a long list of problem statements that we have identified by speaking to the industry speaking to financial institutions, speaking to corporates, speaking to all kind of participants um, in Singapore and beyond to identify real world problems that you as, as a fintech or a technology startup can address. Um, you can find the full list of those problem statements on the website. Um, I think there's about 50 um, across these different buckets. Um, all of them provided by, by members of the industry who stand behind those. Um, and you can see some of the sneak peek examples here on this page. Um, I'll not cover them in detail at this point in time, but it gives you a bit of an idea of some of the specificity that, that we're talking about. Some of these go into data, some of them talk about technology, some of them are really around business models. Um, so it's a very, very exciting and diverse list. I think what I want to point out here is there might be members here in the audience or that are thinking about, I'm a technology startup, I may not think of myself as a fintech we still would like you to participate and think about, can your technology help to solve some of these problem statements, right? Um, so that we get crossover and, and um, leverage the best of the innovation that's out there, even though you may currently not be a FinTech or a CEO as such. So we're very much 
welcoming those participants as well. Now, let me talk a little bit about the process of how this will work and the key dates that you should know on the next page. So the application and registration window is open as of now. So you can now go on to, to the platform that we'll talk about in the, in the next page about where and how you do that. And you can register an account and submit your proposal on the platform. That window is open from now until the 11th of June. That's when we're going to close the platform and review all the proposals that have been submitted. And then over the course of June and July, go through judging rounds to identify the top 15 finalists that we will shortlist and invite for the next stage of the, of the accelerator. The finalists will be announced in August. And after the announcement, these finalists will then work with us through a series of acceleration workshops over September and October. So that's going to be a program of about 10 to 12 weeks where we will pair you with a corporate champion, most likely those corporate champions that have sponsored the problem statements that you have identified and you would like to, to work on, um, and help you strengthen your value proposition, refine your solution, refine your pitch, um, work with more data, and overall help coach and guide you along the way, um, all the way leading up to the presentation at the um, Singapore FinTech Festival Demo Day, which will then basically be the final judging or, um, and evaluation of the finalists to arrive at the winners um, that will be announced at the event itself. Now, let's talk on the next page about what you need to do in order to participate and give you a little bit more details, um, and then I will see whether we have any questions coming in that I can answer um, at this point. So. First of all, how can you register? You have the QR code here on the page. Um, there are multiple links here. Um, you will receive this material and other information by email after this after this webinar. So go to the platform and register. Um, like I said, anyone can register who thinks they have a ready solution um, that fully or partially can address some of the problem statements. So we're not looking for pure concepts or ideas. We're looking for companies that are ready to deploy something or build something in the relatively near term. So I think that's that's important, but otherwise we're agnostic. One of the questions that came in in the chat earlier, I think, was whether this competition is open to only companies from Singapore or the region. It's a global outreach, right? So wherever you are, um, we would love to have you participate in this accelerator and pitch your idea. Um, the problem statements by um, by nature are also designed to, to be global, even though, of course, some of the corporate have identified problems which are more Singapore and Southeast Asia, Asia centric as a starting point. Now, in order to, um, to apply, you need to do two things. Register, create your account, provide us with a bit of simple basic information about your company, where you're organized, the stage of your business, etc. And then it's really about developing your proposal. And essentially that is your pitch to, to us and to the, to the accelerator team that we need to look at to evaluate whether we want you to, sh to be shortlisted as one of the finalists. So that proposal should obviously talk about the problem statements or, or multiple problem statements that you wish to describe your company, describe your solution, help us understand what sets you apart. And you can really think about providing any information that makes the case, right? Be that your existing pitch decks, be that demos, be that videos, anything that you might have available or can then provide us with please make that available um, because this is the, the only information that we will consider with the initial um, shortlisting and, and um, going through the information to arrive at the finalists. Um, in terms of the judging criteria, we're going to look at a few different things. First of all, whether what you've put forward is relevant to the problem statement. We will then start thinking about is there business potential in what you have proposed and put forward? And then think a little bit about innovativeness of the idea. And as we as we heard earlier from the panel, um, we need innovation, we need creative ideas to solve a lot of these problems. So that's very much what we're looking for. And then we'll think about, do we believe that you have the key, the right ingredients in place to help execute and actually implement? Because the whole idea is that after the, the Singapore FinTech Festival and after the finalists have, have completed their work, um, the journey just starts. That's when you start implementing and building your solution further, and we have an eye on that right from the beginning. So that 
are the kind of cornerstones of uh, the FinTech Accelerator. Um, I'll pause here and I'll just check whether we have any questions coming in that I can pick up at this point. Um, so one question just, just came in, uh, applicants must be Singapore registered. I think I've answered that, you can be anywhere, right? You should have, have an interest, obviously, then ultimately to work with the Singapore corporate champion on, on developing your solution, um, but we are agnostic to where you are based. I think that's the only question that came in so far on the process. I think you will receive contact information. You have to contact information of all of us on the on the website. So by all means, reach out afterwards. Right, we are here to help, um, and we'll pick up any any clarifications with all of the words. So with that, let me hand back to Kailin, and yeah, look Thanks. forward to hopefully receiving a lot of questions that we can look at. It's going to be very exciting. Thanks, Ben. I guess in all, we can conclude in today's session that uh, Green FinTech is still a nascent uh, industry and there's so much more we can do as a global citizen with the pandemic and global change uh, as the backdrop. It's increasingly important that we do not stop innovating and leveraging on technologies to solve uh, these challenges. And I, I guess the last bit is you are in the business of innovation. Uh, as what Ben said, do apply for the accelerator. Um, thank you, everybody, for spending time with us. Uh, if you need any additional update about Singapore FinTech Festival on the Green Shoot series, please feel free to follow the updates on the Telegram and all the various social media uh, accounts. Thanks all. Thanks all. Thanks, everybody.